Hi everyone and Wanju, hello and welcome. Uh, welcome specifically to the University of Western Australia and the Public Policy Institute. Uh, you join us just after 5.30 p.m. local time and I'm sure that there are different zones you're tuning into right now. Uh, I'm especially proud of the fact that you are joining us at our campus here, which is a place of learning by the Swan River. And it's traditionally the land of, land of the Noongar people. And it's enormous pride that I have that of course, it is a place of learning in those times as well as these times. And it is part and parcel of our uh, legacy and history to take pride in that here at UWA. As I said a moment ago, um, this is the Public Policy Institute. My name is Shamit Sagar. I am the director of the Institute and a little bit of background, we were established in 2019 by the university. Uh, it is in common with research intensive universities more or less all over the world to make sure that uh, world-class research and the insights that flow from that are properly translated and made accessible to the decision makers, either in government, business, commerce, or indeed nonprofits. And our, institutes, our institute uh, leads that on behalf of the university here. And our primary purpose to ensure that that research uh, makes a difference. And it goes back to the traditions of UWA when it was set up in, in 1911, uh, when the founding fathers of the university established it and talked about UWA serving the prosperity and the well being of the people of the state. So, as then, as now, uh, we carry on that proud tradition. Uh, a little word about the event this evening. Uh, you're joining us on a uh, session to do with, uh, in conversation series to do with healthcare and the future of healthcare, particularly here in WA. Uh, everyone will appreciate it that health has been really higher on the international agenda as compared with the last two years. Uh, and the pandemic, which has been on the front page, has seen WA's health infrastructure go through quite a lot of uh, unexpected stress tests. As we speak, we are at or thereabouts the peak of the Omicron COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And it's likely that WA will be heading for a, an extremely soft landing by any standards, either here in Australia or internationally, uh, or let's hope. So that has prompted us and others to think a little bit about what comes, and be, comes beyond that crisis and looks towards the future in the middle part of the century. Uh, what might the health system here in WA uh, look like as it emerges from these challenges and leave what are the ch challenges further down the line? Uh, issues to do with funding and service models uh, come to mind, and particularly whether or not uh, investment now is likely not just to lead to better healthcare per se, but different ways of going about thinking about the healthcare and looking after the people of the state, uh, undoubtedly as it will grow. Um, in order to shed light on that, I'm merely, merely here to ask the questions. Uh, we are lucky and privileged to have uh, Dr. Omar Korshid. Uh, Omar is the federal president of the Australian Medical Association and has been in that role since 2020. And I gather it's a two year presidency. Uh, so this is the second half of that presidential term. Omar is with us this evening. Uh, amongst other things, he is in fact uh, an author of a new publication uh, from the Institute, uh, WA 2050. Uh, if you Google it, I gather it comes up as the, uh, those, those words comes up as a third or fourth item. But if you go to the Public Policy Institute, website, you'll see it straight away if you'd like to download it. Now, the format this evening is as follows. Uh, I'm going to pose some questions and, and, and have a discussion with Omar for about 30 minutes. Thereafter, we'll have about 15 minutes to have a Q&A. So please use the Q&A function uh, on the Zoom function in order to put your questions in and we'll collate uh, the most important or the most relevant. And we're hoping to land this uh, and finish shortly before 6.30 this evening local time. So let's get started. Uh, our guest this evening as part of this In Conversation series uh, is uh, Omar Korshid, as I mentioned. Uh, he is an orthopedic surgeon. He was born in Melbourne, and of course he's a UWA alumni, I gather getting his medical degree in 1997. Later having a residency in Charles Gardner Hospital here in Perth, and be admitted to as being a fellow of the Royal Australia Australasian College of Surgeons in 2007. He went on to have further experience in Sydney and Edinburgh, learning his trade amongst those at the cutting edge. And he has a specific interest in medical education. It's a very brief sort of pen portrait of our guest this evening. So just to get things going, Omar, I wonder if we could just begin uh, for the benefit of the audience, also the benefit of myself, to get you to talk a little bit about the presidency. I mean, what is it? Tell us a little bit about the AMA 
uh, not all in the audience will be familiar uh, as to what it really is about and, and what your current priorities are. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much for having me tonight. I'd also like to extend uh, my respects to uh, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and, and their elders uh, past and present. So the AMA is uh, is a very large organisation with a very large brief and, you know, we do get referred to as uh, the doctors union and in some places like Western Australia, we actually are pretty much a union. Uh, but at the national level, we're, we're not. We're actually a professional body representing the interests of doctors. Uh, but more and more as the years go by, we are spending most of our time talking about uh, the health system itself uh, and making sure it is uh, delivering for Australians. So uh, we, we have a pretty broad uh, remit. And, and as the president, you actually have a very... Um, uh, you have a lot of latitude really to make of it what you will. And uh, when I made the decision that I wanted to perhaps take on this role, I was thinking about uh, major health reform. That was what I felt the medical profession needed to upskill on. We needed to work out what we think needs to happen so that we can, uh, number one, lead change, but also be in a position to respond quickly to uh, other ideas for change. And if we don't have these discussions and we don't know our own position on these things, then it, it's very hard to be a real player in, in designing the future of the system. And it's very clear to, to all of us in the system that uh, we need to have conversations about reform for our health system to be able to continue to deliver uh, with uh, all the pressures that are on it and all the pressures that are coming. Uh, of course, the pandemic came along, uh, you know, just before uh, the election where I was elected president, and uh, that has really changed the experience for me. It changed the um, the focus, I guess, of my term. Uh, it, it's made it something I've had to do from WA rather than uh, uh, in Canberra and around the country. Uh, and the AMA has had a, a role very much around um, reassuring the community that the decisions that uh, have been made by governments were reasonable, uh, helping communicate uh, to the general public the uh, all the complexities of COVID, what it was, is it real, uh, vaccines, treatments, um, lockdowns, social distancing, masks, all these features of the pandemic that um, have really changed our lives, have transformed our lives, needed explaining to the public, and although government do it, uh, having another voice uh, to, to help uh, in that has been a really critical part of my role and my vice president, uh, a GP, uh, Dr Chris Moy from South Australia uh, in particular has had a, done a really good job at, at helping, um, helping take the community on this journey. As we exit the pandemic, we've had the opportunity to, uh, to, to refocus, I guess, on what I wanted to do in my time, which was all about those, those health reform issues. And with an election just around the corner, uh, that's what we'll be talking about uh, for the most of the remainder of my time. OK, that's fascinating. Just, just before we go, and can I ask a further question on this, which is that uh, what we've seen more than anything else in the last couple of years is, is uh, this government in, in Canberra, but governments all over the world, very conscious they don't want to get on this wrong side of the medical profession in, in relation to COVID specifically. I mean, what's that felt like for you? I mean, you've often been a critic or a commentator about getting things the right way around, form and function. I mean, you've had some specific things to say about WA. Um, has that been as you expected it to be, but, you know, kind of a critic, but, but a sort of friendly critic in some respects? Well, we've had a, a different role at different times, and, and the AMA is actually a big family as well. So, so I, as a national president, have had things to say sometimes which don't quite line up with what, for instance, the WA state president might mm -hmm. be saying. Uh, but I've, I've had the opportunity to stand next to the prime minister and the health minister to uh, at times where that was appropriate to, to reassure, to provide information uh, and to, um, to, I guess, encourage uh, the public that the government are doing the right things but then at other times we've had to push uh, right at the very start of the, the pandemic just before i was elected the AMA had to push pretty hard this current federal government to take the pandemic seriously similarly in western australia um uh, dr andrew miller who took over uh from me as uh president in wa uh pushed very very hard uh to get the wa government to take the steps that it has subsequently taken and in fact reap the benefits of in a huge way with being incredibly popular for, for protecting the health of Western Australians. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't get there by themselves. They needed some nudging. And so they, we, we've taken the role 
uh, that we've needed to at different times in order to achieve the best health, health outcomes. And, and that's, it's been a privilege to be able to do that. Um, and although sometimes it's hard and, you know, we get criticisms, I've had some death threats and, you know, it, it, there's a lot of pressure, I think, on, on public figures at this time. Uh, but it's, it's been an extraordinary uh, experience, I think, for the medical profession, this whole pandemic. Uh, and as one of the voices of the profession, it's, um, it's been a, a very interesting time to be the president. Okay, thank you. So you've risen to be um, sort of the erstwhile leader of this trade union or not trade union, much more of a kind of professional body, as you emphasise. Just, just for the benefit of the audience, a little bit about yourself. I mean, why, why medicine? You graduate, as I said, in the mid 90s. Uh, why this role? You hinted at it a moment ago about reform. Just tell us, take us a little through your sort of personal and professional journey, if you could. Yeah, I came from a non-medical family, and so I had no real deep understanding of the role of a doctor other than the doctors I'd been to see uh, as a child. Uh, but I, I, I guess I've had an interest, you know, before I started high school, I decided I wanted to be a doctor, and that did not change uh, at any time uh, during high school. Um, so I can't say that it was a terribly considered or um, uh, deeply uh, thought of decision, but it was one that was cemented in my mind from, from a pretty early age. And, uh, you know, during training, but based, uh, as you say, uh, at WA, UWA initially and then Perth hospitals, I was thinking actually today I've, I've worked in something like 17 hospitals uh, in WA, both private and public, through my training uh, and subsequently uh, as a specialist. Uh, and I've, I guess I've had my eyes open. Uh, I've been involved in the profession right from the start, from medical school, uh, late medical school, all the way till now, continuously involved in various roles, RMO societies, uh, with the university's curriculum committee when they were thinking of moving to problem-based learning, um, uh, RMO society, the AMA, since I was an intern, um, uh, Australian Medical Council, um, uh, College of Surgeons, Australian Orthopaedic Association, uh, all sorts of uh, roles at different times, a lot of medical education, but also some of those representative. And I've always felt that it's important to experience the breadth of the profession, to understand what drives it um, and to be able to influence uh, how, to, how things work. Because as a doctor, you can influence one patient's outcome at a time. Some, some types of doctors can, do, uh, can be a little bit broader than that. But uh, if you step onto the bigger stage uh, as an AMA president, for instance, there is, uh, there is a real opportunity to influence the health of uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions uh, of people. And if we can get big, important changes through, if we can encourage government to do the right things, uh, we, can, we can transform our nation. And, and I guess that's probably the main driver for me to have kept uh, involved in the AMA throughout my time. Uh, and to have uh, put my hand up for the uh, for the biggest and the toughest job, but also the job that uh, does enable those things, uh, if you can make it work. Sure, that's really, really helpful. And on that point, I mean, the whole point of public policy, of course, is to pull these policy levers so that change can be brought about for large numbers in, in a relatively short period of time, very different from seeing, as, as it were, a patient. So let's talk a bit about that and the sort of bigger picture facing healthcare here in WA, sometimes described as being either on a path um, towards a perfect storm or very close by, and we're not talking about WA's propensity to experience cyclones. So let me just read a couple of um, killer stats, no pun intended. I mean, we appear in Australia to have the lowest ratio of public hospital beds uh, by a clear margin. Bed availability for those under 65 has declined by 50% in the course of the last uh, two and a half decades. And, and, and meanwhile, perversely, uh, healthcare spending, broadly uh, measured, here in the state, is projected to end up being at two in every five dollars in the next five years. Um, so the lion's share, the single biggest ticket item in, in the budget here. So, I mean, how would you explain the size of the coming problems? What keeps you up at night? What do you worry about in terms of either those figures or things that have been brought to your attention? The, the biggest fear for me, I think, is one that hasn't quite been recognised by our, uh, our politicians, the people running our systems, and that is the size of the demand for healthcare that is uh, coming in the very near future. It's not, it's not on the horizon. It's actually, it's here now, and it's going to get a lot worse over the next few years. And, that, and some of those are underlying trends. The, the, the fact that the baby boom are moving uh, from their 70s into their 80s soon, uh, and uh, as we know, the, the vast bulk of your lifetime healthcare 
um, need, well, the, the need for investment, that the expenditure on health is all is almost all at the end of life. It, it is very much concentrated in those years. So we've got, we're going to see a a big increase in the number of people who are in that highest uh, consumption of health resources phase of their lives. Uh, we are through advances in medical technology helping people to stay alive and to stay healthy and to keep a reasonable quality of life with diagnoses that 20 or 30 years ago would have actually ended their life. So people are living not just with diabetes and high, high blood pressure and, um, and high cholesterol, they're living with multiple cancers, having survived horrific diagnoses because of these great advances in technology. Uh, but of course, um, you're living with that cancer still being there, you're living with the consequences of the cancer treatment, um, and of course, all the other comorbidities are there due to lifestyle factors. We have, of course, uh, an increasing rate of obesity. Um, so when you add all that up, and then you also add COVID, um, so the, the delayed, the, the deferred medical care that, that has not happened during the pandemic, people not going to the doctor, not having diagnostic tests, not having their elective surgery done, plus the potential for a tail, you know, long COVID. We don't really know with Omicron, BA2, which is the virus spreading around WA at the moment, what is the impact of that on health, on the health of people who've had that virus uh, for the next couple of years? We just don't know. That There's some scary studies suggesting a significant increase in vascular diseases, for instance, with the earlier uh, types of COVID, whether it'll apply to this so-called milder variant or not, uh, we just don't know. So adding all that up, huge demand right around the country for healthcare. And WA is unique in having a large budget surplus um, and being the one uh, government, state government in the country that has the resources to do something about the capacity of the health system, but also a system that last year couldn't actually cope with winter demand in a year where there was no flu and no COVID. So elective surgery stopped, hospitals were bursting at the seams uh, last winter with neither of those factors, which will be present this year. We will have COVID, we will have some level of influenza as the international borders open. Uh, and that is scary. That, that is what keeps me awake because there's no time to increase the capacity of the system. There's no time to get extra staff uh, to run the system. So we're just going to have to push through as best we can. Um, but I really would like us for us to address these uh, underlying factors so that this situation is not just five times worse in five or 10 years time. Okay, that's, that's really fascinating. And I'm going to push you a little bit on the, the, the money side of it, because it's a constant theme that comes up. And we're going to talk a bit about culture and organisation in a second. But remember, cast your mind back just under a year when the state um, posted a surplus of 5.9 billion. Uh, the discussion as of this morning is the state budget will be in surplus with a figure beginning with eight. So if anything, significantly larger by almost um, you know, 40, 50 percent. So I'm, I, the, I want, what I want you to keep in mind is, is this is, is the casual listener is going to sort of say to them, why don't we just throw money at it? Why don't we just blitz it? This is a kind of common refrain you'll get. So is it that? I mean, is that how much emphasis would you put on that? No one's going to argue for not having more resource. I understand that. But is it equally going to be about the uh, questions to do with culture and organisation, how people work together? Just give a sense of how you react to that. Uh, I think we need to invest in the uh, to, to address the lack of investment for the last uh, period of time. And I think that period of time is probably measured in, in decades. We have to address the aging infrastructure of healthcare. We've got large hospitals that are literally falling apart. Uh, and our healthcare sector, that the capital budget for healthcare is tiny compared with the operational expenditure. Nothing like what a normal business would do. So there is not investment, there's no plan for renewing uh, capital infrastructure and for uh, expanding as the population expands. And hence, we do have the lowest number of beds per head of population. We do have uh, around the country uh, a 30 year decline in the number of beds uh, and it's now half what it was, as you mentioned. So yes, there is a need for spending, but of course it's gotta be smart spending. Yes, there is a need for new beds now. Unfortunately, we, we do have to do that. We have to make that investment, but as you say, it will take over the state budget if we don't look to do things smarter. And anyone who works in health will tell you that the explosion of staffing in health seems to be at the non-clinical end. The, the hospitals are now full of all sorts of people. And as clinicians, we're not absolutely sure what they do. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, culturally a review of our health system, why is it that um, the, the support people, the bureaucracy has exploded to the extent that it has? What is it about our system that drives that and that needs that? 
And are we investing uh, the enormous amount of money we spend on people in health? Are we investing that wisely? Um, so I think that's one thing. The other is uh, targeted investments in things that make a difference. And I think here, um, IT uh, infrastructure, uh, I've heard from people in the know that we're about a decade behind in WA where we should be in terms of the IT infrastructure that supports healthcare. We still use fax machines in health. I mean, who else in the economy uses fax machines? This is, this is how far behind we are. Most other states in the country have uh, either an electronic medical record or plans for one. Uh, and an EMR isn't just about having a digital record rather than a paper one. It's about enabling future change and reform, such as artificial intelligence, the use of decision support aids to help doctors and nurses make the right call at the right time. Um, a proper IT system will help communication and lack of communication, poor communication drives inefficiency and duplication of tests and things like that. We do have structural issues in our health system in terms of uh, different funders for primary care, for aged care versus the hospitals. There are barriers there, they are, they are siloed, but you can improve, you can address that siloing through good investments in uh, technology. So we'd, we'd like to see that as um, one of the key platforms of a government that is actually interested in not just solving the immediate health problems, the ambulance ramping, the elective surgical waiting lists, but one that wants to uh, address that, that deeper problem of how can we afford healthcare in 10 or 20 years time. Okay, okay, let's go to that. So let's talk a little bit about those, those cultural issues and drill into them. So cast your mind back to the 2019 WA Sustainable Health Review, as you'll know, uh, it said essentially in a nutshell, to meet future demand, there would be a cultural shift that's going to be needed. And that was about shifting away from a reactive, acute hospital-based system of healthcare, in other words, relying upon the acute sector, uh, to an approach that was more preventative and takes a sort of whole of life perspective. I mean, that's, those are wonderful words, and, and very few people are going to argue about that uh, in of itself. But, but from your point of view, either your experience uh, as, as a medical professional or in, in the role that you have right now, what do you think are the key pieces that, that make up that approach? What, what would you like to get in the right order to fulfill that vision of that health review? The, the problem with the sustainable health review is that it is just too high level and it makes these statements that everyone, as you say, would agree with. Absolutely. Let's keep people healthier. Let's, let's invest in prevention and in, um, in secondary prevention rather than at the most expensive, most difficult uh, time. But the problem is for a state government, you don't have many of the levers that you need. You can't really improve the quality of primary care because you don't pay for it. You don't organise it. You don't have anything to do with it, really. Um, on prevention, some of the things you've got to do uh, are not necessarily electorally popular. So for instance, uh, things like a volumetric tax on alcohol or a sugar sweetened beverage tax that might change people's behaviours to assist in uh, longer term uh, prevention in, in preventing obesity, preventing diabetes, which then prevents all the secondary complications, the cancers, the heart attacks, the, the other things that are associated with those uh, conditions. That's a no brainer. Every single health organization would say we should be doing that. We should have done it yesterday. The, the previous health minister, very keen on that stuff. But could he get his own government over the line on any of those things? No. Uh, and that, that is a real problem for us. So if you're going to rely on prevention and you're going to rely on better quality primary care to keep people out of hospitals, which absolutely the AMA and any health commentator would agree with, you've actually got to do it. Uh, and I think that's where the sustainable health review will fall down and will, will turn out to be, in my view, uh, a document that sits on the shelf and doesn't get implemented because it just didn't answer those questions. And even if you can answer those questions, even if we had a forward-looking government that did invest 5% of its health budget in prevention, which I think is the WA government policy. They're not doing it, but it's their policy. We'd like to see the national government doing the same. Even if you did that, the dividends take time to deliver and we must look after people's care now, not just uh, say, well, we don't need to invest in capital. We don't need to invest in the people and the systems uh, that support good quality healthcare now because we're going to keep people healthier. Well, if they're healthier, they make good decisions now. It may reduce your need or reduce the need for increased health expenditure in 20 years but it's not necessarily going to stop someone fronting up to the emergency department with their heart attack tomorrow. Okay, so, and just on that, I mean, let's just drill into a bit more. Uh, one thing that strikes me is that there's this lack of coordination between states and Commonwealth, so not having the right levers. You often hear this in education, unrelated, compulsory education, uh, where there's parts of the reform that's enjoyed by Commonwealth government, they pull the levers, particularly around sort of testing, NAPRAN and so on. 
and then there's state investment in in the sort of the schools and parts of it and the teachers so i mean one of the things that comes out of this pandemic of course has been national cabinet and an attempt to coordinate what states are doing and commonwealth government is doing albeit just for the purpose of pandemic has taken over everything would you be in favor of, of some sort of re recasting of what the feds are doing and what state is doing given the observation you made about the fact that they've got nothing to do with gps yeah, and it's actually a very um, attractive concept that, for instance, in health, you might have a single funder. So, that, you yeah. know, we end the blame game. And I think Kevin Rudd said he was going to end the blame game in health. He didn't uh, because the so-called enormous reforms that were done, uh, some of them were undone by the following government and uh, and they weren't as deep as, as advertised anyway. Uh, a single funder sounds good, um, but you have to wonder who is the single funder. Is it Canberra? Because I can tell you, what you don't want, you don't want Canberra trying to run health services that, that they just don't do service delivery. They would not be able to mm -hmm. um, uh, supervise a system that is all about massive scale service delivery. Um, should it be the states? Well, it would be a pretty substantial reform to, for the states to be in a position that they could be single funders. Um, and it's the scale of reform that Australian governments have absolutely no appetite for. Uh, so, for instance, if you um, if you went for a big increase in the GST, a broad based tax uh, that where that money went straight to state governments, they might be in a position to run the health system if they had the ability to raise the money they need. Uh, but even a conversation around GST reform, even if it was just to broaden the 10 percent to everything or if it was to go from 10 to 12 percent, no politician can have that conversation in Australia. Uh, unfortunately, there is there is no risk appetite from our leaders at the moment, and, and that really hamstrings us. So it comes back to talking about reforms that are more realistic, and uh, I think we, we need to look to technology, we need to look at specific programs uh, that can address some of these issues, acknowledging the slight, you know, the siloing that is there, acknowledging that we need to break it down, let's look at ways to break it down and to get what we can out of the system. Uh, and, and maybe to trial, you know, small scale interventions. And one thing that we've supported as the AMA, for instance, was a single funder trial up in the Kimberley, where you have uh, a needy population in terms of health uh, needs and health outcomes, uh, but in fact, a lower expenditure per head of population on, on the medical benefits schedule and on the pharmaceutical benefits schedule. So um, from the Commonwealth money, uh, individuals in the Kimberley are getting less than they should be getting. Uh, and that just doesn't make sense, does it? So if you if you could package that up and, and give the state, for instance, all the MBS and PBS money that should be applicable to that population, and then let let, let them run a system for the Kimberley, that's something that we've, we've been interested in as a concept, as a, as a trial. Uh, but again, I haven't been able to get it over the line just yet. Okay, so, so on that, I mean, I, I was going to save all the kind of questions at the end, but we've had something come in that has to do with this sort of, as you, you mentioned the Kimberley and NWA you know, region is very important. I just want to share this question with you and get your sense of it. It's about medical professions. It makes the point, it's very difficult to recruit and retain medical professions in rural and regional WA, frankly, rural and real regional Australia. So, I mean, what do you think the causes are of this? I mean, you spend time with the rank and file. You have a sense of the kind of pull and push factors. Um, and do you think there are any solutions you can offer either at state level or federal level? So I'm taking you in that direction, the sense of spreading out medical and health care on a regional and rural basis. So governments have been trying to address our shortage of rural doctors and medical services more generally for decades. Uh, and many things have been tried. The, the factors are well known, uh, but it's the solutions that have been hard and they're, and they're, they're long term solutions. So the, the, the causes, I'll, I'll list a few of them very quickly, because I think, as I said, this is not controversial. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's lifestyle factors, it's education for children, it's job opportunities for spouses, um, it's lack of support, uh, it's lack of um, quality of life mix. Some doctors feel they're always on call. Uh, the more rural or remote they are, they don't get breaks. Hard to get professional education, uh, can't get a locum to cover you when you want to go away. Um, it's all those sorts of factors. Uh, the professional satisfaction of working in a well-resourced system. The reality is that our rural hospitals, our rural infrastructure, especially in WA, has been allowed to uh, deteriorate. And you just, you know, uh, I remember um, someone in the health department suggesting there should be an orthopedic surgeon in every town in the wheat belt uh, until we pointed out that there aren't any hospitals where you can do orthopedic surgery. 
in the wet belt. So <laughs> what's the point of having a surgeon who can't operate? You know. Mm. So unfortunately, the you know that there are a whole series of factors that make rural practice difficult or unattractive to doctors, as they do for any other profession, and we just need to address those. So some of the things we know do work. Uh, trying to get more rural uh, students into medical school. Uh, that's been uh, uh, shown to be a significant factor at retention in rural areas. Tr getting experience, such as the rural clinical schools that UWI has and has had for a long time, they've got a, a better rate of retention of uh, rural students. And you've got, you know, the more time you spend in a rural area as a student, the more chance you'll meet your partner there. Uh, and they will have roots and family connections and things that will be a pull factor to keep you there rather than uh, the new professional or other issues which might drive you to the city. Um, there are economic factors. We know that uh, you, you need to put some money into uh, uh, strategies to uh, attract and retain uh, doctors as well as other types of uh, professional to rural areas. But, but also you need, to, you need to treasure the people who are there. And unfortunately, I've heard many stories of, of doctors whose experience in rural areas have been negative. You know, they've been uh, not well treated by management of the WA Country Health Service, for instance, um, or, or the local hospital. They've not had opportunities to uh, access facilities, operating theatres or um, uh, uh, the ED. Uh, we hear of, of um, obstetricians, you know, GPs who've got that skill and interest in uh, delivering babies, but they're not allowed to access the hospital because you've got a midwife led model which means they only want you to come in and do the emergency cesarean section in the middle of the night, but they don't want you to do the routine stuff. They don't want you to have a relationship with the patients and so on. So it's about a little bit of professional respect. It's about treating people well. Uh, it's about, um, as I said, pulling those levers we've got in terms of rural training. Um, and uh, and we just have to keep, keep working at it. So I think some of those things, as I said, have some evidence behind them. Uh, and those things that have evidence behind them should be uh, invested in further. Um, and, and hopefully we can we can make a difference in the longer term. Thank you for that. So let's just go back to where we were a moment ago. I mean, in your role as uh, AMA president, uh, you normally would go sort of go around the country. You probably haven't given the kind of COVID and, and people being stuck there. But typically an AMA president is a, in a good position to talk about how things are done in other states. It's a, it's a constant refrain here in Australia, which is, uh, you know, where's best practice? Is it typically a kind of southeast corner state? And so on. So what have you been struck by? I mean, some of the objective figures do, sh do show that uh, NSW have got some very, very good outcomes in terms of planning, dealing with some of the issues that you've been bringing up, but also the cultural factors. What have you been particularly impressed with? And it, by the way, it may well be here in WA. I don't want to sort of preclude that and say everything is better elsewhere. But, but what, what inspires you that, particularly around um, you know, best, best practice in the country? Well, before I answer your proper question, I will just say something that did inspire me very recently. Uh, having uh, Since the borders um, were relaxed, I've, I've been out of the uh, state three times now, and one of those trips was to Launceston. Uh, and while there, I was able to visit the Launceston Health Hub, uh, which is a, a private general practice uh, run by a pretty entrepreneurial uh, uh, doctor, husband and wife. And they've created this amazing, vibrant uh, practice with uh, lots and lots of GPs, lots of uh, there's a whole wing of allied health, a whole wing of specialists, a pathology lab in the basement, childcare centre on the roof, a pharmacy in the place with a robot that does the dispensing. And it just looked like a vibrant, uh, connected community. Uh, and you sort of think, wow, I wish, I wish we could take that model and just transplant it around the country. Uh, but, but at the kind of more traditional level of which states are doing well, that there's no doubt there's variation between our states in terms of the performance of their public hospital systems, for instance. New South Wales, relatively uh, better um, than, for instance, Tasmania and South Australia and the ACT, where, where access and uh, access in terms of emergency departments and, and elective surgery is poor. When it comes to deeper reforms, though, thinking of new ways of doing things, uh, again, New South Wales has some structures that we don't have here in WA or haven't developed as well here in WA. Uh, you know, clinical excellence um, uh, bodies trying to drive reform of clinical care. Um, they've run that there's a there was a pilot run out of Western Sydney in diabetes management uh, in primary care to, to, to demonstrate that if you manage chronic diseases like diabetes better in the community with the resources that you need, that you can achieve good outcomes. Uh, and and that, that pilot showed that. Um, but uh, we, we are 
suffering from the same pressures all around the country. And the reason that, that I decided to push very hard for a 50-50 funding with the Commonwealth, so a major reform to uh, hospital funding bigger than the Rudd Gillard reforms, $20 billion price tag over four years, was because I can see that every state and territory, no, no matter how well or poorly the government is doing, no matter how much they invest as a proportion of their state uh, revenue in health, they're all facing the same problems of, of lack of access to those hospitals. Um, and, uh, and therefore, I think we need some national solutions, but of course, we also need to do more when it comes to research in, in primary care in particular, to try and develop models that are suitable for the Australian context. Because you, you do see good ideas from overseas. There's New Zealand does things differently. There's Scandinavian countries that have invested heavily in primary care and shut a whole pile of hospitals but they have to be interrogated in an Australian context. Our health system is unique. It is actually pretty good overall. 10% of GDP on health, some of the world's best uh, uh, life expectancy figures. Um, so we're actually pretty good. Uh, I think our public-private mix, um, allowing both systems to grow to a sustainable level and to almost compete with each other is a key factor there. So when looking at all that public stuff that we've mostly been talking about, you also want to make sure your policy levers for private healthcare are right, that private health insurance is affordable for Australians, that um, the, uh, the, the, the various players and on that sector, the hospitals, the doctors, the insurers, the device manufacturers, the pharmaceutical companies, that they've all got sustainable business models, but they're working together to try and make health more affordable going forward. So I think there's, there's lots and lots of opportunities here. And what, what we need is, is for um, people to step up, show some leadership. That's what we're trying to do at the AMA. Um, and actually try some things out, do some research, take some risks, because without that, uh, we are just heading down a pathway of actually dropping down the list uh, of health outcomes uh, when we compare with other uh, similar countries. Uh, and that will happen in a fairly short space of time if we don't, don't act now. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, um, you write in this WA 2050 report, and I quote, a new funding model would allow hospitals to look beyond their walls and keep people healthy in the community, give them enough beds while encouraging innovation and performance improvement and ensure they have the tools to achieve this. You wanna just share with the, um, the viewers what you had in mind. I mean, clearly you're trying to get at this point about a new funding model. How's it different from the current funding arrangements? And, and, and where do you anticipate the problems in terms of embracing that model in the future? Yeah. Uh Thank you. That this question's right up my alley. Been talking about it a lot lately. So really, what we're talking about here is public hospital funding, but also allowing public hospitals to function as more than just traditional uh, hospitals. So right now, the Commonwealth funds forty-five percent, approximately, uh, of the cost of hospitals. It varies state by state, and the states around about fifty-five percent. And what we hear time and time again from the health department uh, and from government, both both sides of uh, politics at a national level, is that public hospitals are a state problem. You know, the states can look after them. We're not responsible for their performance. And that makes a lot of conversations about improving things very, very difficult. The Commonwealth doesn't take responsibility. And so one reason we're seeking 50-50 funding is for the Commonwealth to acknowledge it is an equal partner with the states. It is responsible and it has to uh, share the load of fixing the system rather than saying it's a state problem. We just throw some cash at it. The... Uh, so in seeking 50-50 funding, there's a, a philosophical element to it that, that we think 50-50 works. And there's a, there's a precedent in the, the COVID funding uh, over the last couple of years, billions and billions of dollars. It has been shared 50-50 uh, between the states and the Commonwealth. And, and that, that, I think, is a template uh, for the future. But it's not just about money. We also need to be changing the funding formula so that it doesn't just reward uh, units of activity through a facility, uh, what that's done, which is our current system, what that's done is it's driven the efficiency up, it's driven the price down of healthcare, but it hasn't encouraged states to invest in capacity and it hasn't, uh, it doesn't encourage hospitals or systems to try and do better, to try and spend more money to achieve a better outcome. For instance, you might, by doing a procedure better or by looking after someone's care better, you might reduce your chance of readmission. Uh, or you might achieve a better health outcome in some other, on some other measure. And at the moment, that's not rewarded. What's rewarded is if the patient comes back again and needs another, health, another treatment, and then another one, and then another one. That, that's what the public system is rewarded for. So, uh, so really looking at uh, rewarding performance, rewarding outcomes, not just uh, units of activity. Uh, and of course, 
um, breaking down some of the barriers to allow, not just in the public sector, by the way, but also in the private sector, to allow the funder to actually reach out further into the community and to, to follow the patients and to say, well, the hospital episode, you know, traditionally ends here, but maybe we can blur that a bit. And, and although we've got hospital in the home, it's still a very much a hospital centric model. And for instance, right now, you may not know this, a GP can't go and see a patient who's, a, who's officially under a hospital in the home model with a hospital because they're an admitted patient and it's not allowed for Medicare to be billed for an admitted patient. Um, so we just, we just don't really have the right structure to reward and, and, uh, and to uh, encourage systems to develop uh, care models in the home that keep people away from those very expensive uh, hospitals. So that, that's at the core of our uh, public hospital reform. But of course, to do that and to have any chance of keeping that hospital system uh, affordable, you must improve quality of care and primary care. So we've got a whole series of suggestions around how to do that. But that is a big, big set of reforms as well with, with big prices if you were going to do it properly. And of course, uh, aged care is probably one where there's some shorter term wins, you know, treating aged care facilities like healthcare facilities, beefing up their uh, capacity to look after uh, their residents and treat them like patients to look after their needs, uh, to avoid them having to go to an emergency department for something that could and should be delivered uh, in the facility. If you do those things, if you invest in aged care, if you invest in primary care, it'll help, uh, of course, the, the pressure on the public hospital system. But as I mentioned right at the start, we've got to do all of these because the, the pointy end, the hospital end is in crisis right now. So while investing in that, we also have to do these other things around primary care, aged care, and of course, prevention. Okay, thank you. So now just shifting on, I mean, um, we talk regionally, but of course, patients and healthcare needs come in, in different sizes, in different in different forms. So here, obviously, there's a big emphasis upon trying to ensure the health outcomes of Indigenous Australians are at least keeping pace with the, some of the improvements we've seen, particularly in acute care and acute illnesses. So, I mean, given those difference in health outcomes and, and health priorities for Indigenous Australians relative to non-Indigenous ones, are quite large and not necessarily getting any closer. What measures would you emphasize to prioritize, particularly at Commonwealth level, but also at state as well, that would help to get some real traction on that? This is an area that has been around for some time, particularly with the National Closing the Gap project. So if we as a society are truly committed to closing the gap, we have to, uh, we have to look beyond the health system. Uh, health has some things to do, no doubt about that. Uh, but actually, to, act, to, to, to have any hope of changing this over a 10 or 20 year period, we have to look at uh, early childhood, we have to look at housing, we have to look at, um, at the disadvantage, the inequity that, that uh, these Australians are uh, experiencing and are, that are directly impacting them having any chance of a similar health outcome to other Australians who haven't been uh, exposed to those factors. You know, if you don't address alcohol consumption from the parent, uh, the outcomes from the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder are inevitable. Mm -hmm. And there's very little we can do uh, to change that. I mean, there, are, there is suggestion if we intervene early, we can make a difference, maybe. But gee, wouldn't it be better to prevent it in the first place? So really uh, paying proper attention. Now, again, this is at mostly at a Commonwealth level to, to achieving educational outcomes, housing, uh, safe housing, uh, those uh, public... Um, health issues like food security, uh, fresh water, reduced sugar consumption, all these things uh, need to be addressed now for us to have any chance of closing the gap uh, in the future. In the health system itself, uh, I think we are uh, on a pathway to um, doing our bit to help close the gap. We are acknowledging more and more the need for culturally safe uh, health care. Um, and that's a, that's a journey. We're not certainly not there yet because we still we know that uh, Aboriginal Australians do experience uh, uh, racism in hospitals, casual as well as overt. And we also know that even um, even healthcare workers, even Aboriginal doctors, experience racism uh, within their workplace. Uh, but we we are slowly, too slowly, but slowly increasing the number of Aboriginal doctors uh, in the workforce. But we've got an awful long way to go before we even achieve parity. Um, so in the meantime, whilst we are working on that, we also need to uh, address um, cultural safety for all healthcare workers so that we understand uh, what we need to do to, to do our bit to help close the gap and to make sure that 
the most vulnerable people in our community are able to at least access the same or have the same access to healthcare as everybody else. Um, and that, that is not the case uh, at the moment. But as I said before, to make the bigger difference, we've got to go right back in time and, and address those social issues, those social determinants, which are, in my opinion, uh, absolutely at the core of closing the gap. Okay, that, that's fascinating. It'd be interesting to see how your successor and, and the presidential team continue that, that sort of theme uh, over a period of time. In other words, it's, it's doctors plus, it's not doctors by themselves by any means. Look, time is going to slip away. I'm just conscious. I want to get a couple of other questions to you. And, and there's a, a series that have come in. I'll, I'll put them to you in a second. But um, I mean, this is on sort of, um, you know, your role as president and, and much more as a kind of campaign or public advocate kind of role, I suppose, which is to do with um, what kind of sort of reforms in policy and practice, again, have you noticed in this particular role you've had for the last year and a bit? Um, and I'm interested in things to do with, for example, policy levers such as sugar taxes or changing behaviour. As you know, there's been a penchant for this all over the world. Government's been quite interested in thinking about things they can sort of take away or nudge people to do differently. Huge emphasis upon trying to do it in such a way that, as it were, ordinary people, ordinary consumers don't know this. You'll be familiar with this sort of um, you know, medics spending time with psychologists, spending time with economists and so on. What, what's your feeling here about the kind of reforms that could be brought about that where we would see healthcare benefits down the track? So I, I think this is a, a very, uh, it's an area that just has had not had anywhere near enough uh, emphasis on, on it. Here in WA, there was a preventive health uh, summit under Previous Minister Roger Cook, um, where a lot of good stuff was talked about. But um, again, we haven't seen that translate into, into action. Uh, at the AMA, we're, we're very aware, having um, with the medical profession, having led the anti-smoking uh, movement back in the uh, in the 70s, uh, by having a um, uh, I guess a public policy approach that has tweaked multiple different levers, we have changed our country. We've changed the health outcomes. We've changed life expectancy uh, of our country by sticking with it. By 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 trying to change behaviour, by informing people, but also using price signals, using, um, you know, bans, using uh, a variety of different levers, those horrible uh, photos that we used to see then plain packaging. But by pulling different levers, we've been able to change a very ingrained behaviour that, that, that was a true uh, chemical addiction as well as a behaviour, but it takes decades. Now, we, we know we need to see the same uh, with sugar. Sugar is uh, an area where uh, there's an extraordinary amount of preventable disease that is um, present in our community through obesity and all its consequences, through diabetes and all its consequences. And, you know, every public health body will tell you that to reduce sugar consumption would be a good health outcome. Many countries around the world have implemented sugar taxes as a way to achieve that. And they are successful in changing behaviour uh, to, to an extent. Uh, at the AMA, we've, we've it's been our policy that there should be a, a sugar tax for a long time, but there's just no interest publicly. So we decided to do things differently and to talk directly to the public. And, and um, not long ago, I launched our Sickly Sweet campaign uh, over this summer, which was designed to talk directly to, in particular, in particular, young Australians and say, here is the outcome. Look at this, think about this. When you go to pick up the Coke, why not pick up a water? Uh, with with brightly coloured um, uh, social media tiles and and slightly cheeky um, uh, parodies of uh, some of the advertising that we see for soft drinks, um, and so that was a different approach. We've not done that before uh, as the AMA. We're now doing that as well with our public hospital campaign. But at the same time, the back part of that campaign is a sugar sweetened beverage tax, uh, and we've 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 had an economist uh, model that. We know that it's a win win win. We know that. Uh, the consumer wins, the government wins, it raises revenue. Um, uh, there was health outcomes, which you can measure in dollars and of course, uh, improve quality of life, reduced uh, disease. Um, and uh, the beverage industry won't lose because they'll still sell their products. They'll just be differently formulated products. Even the Queensland uh, sugar farmers won't lose because when we model it up, the impact of a, of a sugar sweetened beverage tax of 40 cents per 100 grams, which is what we're suggesting in excise, would be minuscule below the normal market fluctuations that you see month by month. So it's it's obvious public policy, but I can tell you now, neither of our major parties will take it on. So we're going to keep going with our communication directly to people, and we hope that um, you know other like-minded organisations uh, will will 
continue to do the same. So that's one focus on one area, but it's one where I think um, you know we've we've had some uh, recent activity. Uh, I mentioned before a volumetric tax on alcohol. It, it's not it's it's fair. It's logical. It doesn't necessarily put the price up of the average person's alcohol consumption, but at the risky end of consumption, it really puts the price up. The very, very cheap high alcohol mm -hmm. content products become harder to buy and therefore consumption will definitely reduce. It is so obvious the, the benefit that you would achieve by that simple um, measure, uh, but um, yeah, even a floor price, you don't even have to raise any, re raise any revenue. If you're too scared to, uh, to, to call something a tax or to reform the tax, you can just put a floor price on. Again, there's, there's no interest in that. And that, that is really uh, disappointing for us as a medical profession, but we're going to keep, um, keep pushing for it. So that's something we talked about before, which is, I mean, I guess the theme is that the public could well be ahead of the politicians. And we saw this debate, particularly around sort of climate change and, and you know, uh, the bushfires a couple of summers ago. So there's a huge amount of risk adversity in Australian politics at federal level. I mean, we're seeing quite a lot of it, obviously, in the run-up to the election. And it'd be interesting to watch how advocates, AMA and others, are able to sort of push this and get the public on side. So ultimately, the voting public is ahead of these issues of reform relative to governments. Um, it's certainly be one of your legacy. Look, there's very little time now. I want to just um, switch to another question that came in. It's much more, um, it's about you and a bit of commentary around you, which is that, Given, I'll read it out. Given your role as a successful public advocate for the medical professions and healthcare, can you reflect on the importance of communication as a skill? I mean, I'm not the first to point out that you're able to uh, take very complex medical and public policy matters and articulate them in a way that's quite digestible. So well done on that halfway through your presidency. But I mean, you're in a good position to think a little bit about that communication skill. I mean, what is needed to be successful in persuading communities, whether they're politicians or ordinary people living ordinary lives. Some reflections from you? Look, I think uh, that type of communication skill is a key skill actually for all doctors. Uh, mm. We have to translate the incredible uh, medical science that is out there that is almost overwhelming. We've got to somehow turn that into something that number one, we can understand and we can digest. And then we've got to be able to explain it to our patients. And we do that every single day. So I think, you know, many medical, medical practitioners are, are able to, some perhaps so than others, you have to acknowledge. But, um, and in the AMA, it's a, it's, a, it's a key skill that we need our, our public figures to, to have. Um, I joke sometimes that as an orthopedic surgeon with uh, perhaps um, what many of our colleagues in other specialties would be con considered to be limited medical knowledge, that perhaps I'm... Uh, closer uh, to the general public in terms of my understanding of a lot of these medical things than, 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 than say, a GP or a physician might be. But I think really uh, I just see uh, the conversations I have with the public through, um, through the media and through the uh, things that we're doing as, as very similar to this, the conversations I have directly with my patients one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, and I think uh, we need to be very careful in using um, the respect that doctors have in the community the respect in my case that the AMA has in the community for good. Uh, we need to build that, um, build that respect, build that confidence in the community, build our reputation, but also be very careful about how we use it uh, because it's, it is easy, of course, to destroy it uh, as well. Uh, but it, it's, it's certainly um, something that I think a lot about and we, we obviously through a big team plan our communications very, very carefully. And I think that can sometimes make an AMA president look, look a little better than perhaps they really are. That's nice of you to say so in that sense. Okay. And just quickly, um, I mean, we've got a few bits to go through in a second. Um, a theme that crops up. I mean, you're just over halfway through. I mean, is it too early to speak a little bit about what comes next for you? Obviously, you've got a, a successful practice. You have to go and practice your trade. You want to make sure that you're not sort of out of the saddle too long. All those things are taken as read. But you've gone through a unique experience. You're now representing, articulating, advocating, and all these things we've talked about. I mean, how do you think you might want to sort of take some of these experiences personally uh, and respond to the question of what comes next? Yeah, it's a question I get asked quite a lot, uh, Shamit, uh, and I, I don't have a clear answer in my own head. Um, I think uh, having done a, a, a number of different roles, all mostly within the profession over time, what I've generally done is, is moved on to a new thing and use the skills that I've developed in the previous roles to, to enhance my performance in the new ones. And, and it, I've been really lucky to be able to 
uh, step, I guess, through my profession uh, through these various roles and, and learn and grow uh, each time. This, of course, has been, uh, as you mentioned, a fairly unique experience and, and puts me in an unusual position of, of what's next because most things that I could do would be um, you know, less prominent and perhaps uh, less stressful and less difficult than, than what I've done in the last uh, year, year and a half or so. So look, I don't know, but I, I can tell you a couple of things I do know. Um, I want to stay a clinician. I think, you know, as a, as a doctor that, that represents others or that talks in public uh, areas, you, you need to have credibility. You need to be a practicing uh, doctor, I think, to, to retain uh, that connection with your, your patients. Um, so I, I will continue to be, no matter what, uh, a working uh, clinician. And look, you know, I've got, I've got things I haven't done yet in my career that I'm sort of interested in. I haven't done really any research. So you think, well, maybe, maybe I could pivot into that. There's obviously um, in our health system, there's, there's, uh, there's leadership and management roles where I think they would benefit from uh, experienced uh, doctors stepping up, but they're generally roles that, you know, are not super attractive. So mm -hmm. something you, yeah, you sort of uh, gulp a little bit when you think about some of them, but yeah, um, the, the, the great privilege of the position I'm in is that there are lots of options and um, yeah, as I guess, I'll just have to think about that more as time goes on. Okay, well, I'm not surprised others have asked you that question and you don't have to have a definitive answer by any means, I should have said that. Um, look, time is very much slipping, slipping away. I think the most useful thing to do now would be just to try to bring it to a close. I know there's a couple of other questions. Um, I've struggled as to whether or not there's enough time or maybe one. OK, here's one. OK, and it, it's a continuous the same conversation. I mean, doctors, healthcare workers are um, equally vulnerable themselves. I'm not sure people always appreciate that. Um, I mean, you know, there's staff shortages, there's excess demand, there's the ageing population, as you said. Um, I mean, how do you ensure that, that um, there's your colleagues, not just yourself, avoid that kind of burnout because people look to their positions for healing no less and it's a, it's a big responsibility um and and how might you sort of um incentivize the professionals medical professionals to look after themselves i mean it's a lot of things there but what, what comes to mind yeah. well uh there's no doubt that burnout is uh is a huge problem right around the world in healthcare systems and post covid it's it's extraordinary we, we are hearing so many stories of healthcare workers just uh having had enough and leaving particularly nurses uh, but of course the same pressures um, uh, have an impact on the medical profession as well. And, and the, one of the problems we have in, in hospitals and in healthcare is that we are so focused on our patients that we sometimes forget about our colleagues and ourselves. Uh, that leads to poor behaviours. Uh, it leads to you know, bullying and harassment in the workplace. It, it exacerbates some of those negatives and the burnouts and things, uh, but it's, a, it's a, a little bit of chicken and egg. So I think, you know, we have as a medical profession tried to focus more on our own internal culture, uh, to be more open, to be more respectful of each other. Uh, that's a, a journey. Uh, but of course, we've also got to address those workplace factors. You've got to address the, 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 the hours, the, the demand, the physical facilities as well. Uh, and we need, our, uh, we need our managers to facilitate um, uh, our clinician leaders to be able to set a standard when it comes to culture and behaviour in the workplace. I think if we do those things, then a lot of the mental health issues uh, that we see within the mental, the medical profession in particular and in health more generally will be better. Um, but of course, we also, we've got very clear policies in AMA and I think the medical board does as well that doctors need to remember that we are also patients. We are also uh, ordinary people and we need to specifically look at our own health. We do need to have our own GP and that's something we say to every young doctor, every intern coming out of the system. Number one, go get your own GP. In fact, the AMA has a list of, G of GPs that are willing to look after their colleagues because that's a tough and interesting interaction in itself. Um, mm. And uh, I think we can all do better when it comes to uh, remembering to uh, that, that classic line, physician, heal thyself. Yeah, that brings to mind my late uncle, Dr. Paul Sugger, who was precisely that. You won't have known him, but he epitomised all those values, both on behalf of his um, patients, but frankly, when he's writing prescriptions for his um, under five children and, and frankly failing to do so. His, his, his late wife um, was not none too happy. That was, a, that was an aside. Okay, look, time really has elapsed. A um, couple of quick points. I mean, first of all, can I just thank Omar for sharing um, his thoughts and his perspective uh, with us? Um, this is the first of our In Conversation series. It's designed to attract figures such as yourself. And I hope the, uh, the audience this evening have found it helpful to do that. I think in the future, it'd be great to sort of do the fireside chat in person or at least have a sort of virtual fire right we're kind of facing each other we should be sort of 
at angles, uh, but we can improve upon that. Can I also take time to thank the team behind the scenes, Rebecca and Chris, and our two new interns who are joining us for the first time this evening. Um, I think they've been busy in, in Twitter land. And can I also plug the Institute's uh, forthcoming events while I've got your attention? So on the 28th of April, in an online webinar, we're uh, talking about the future of suburbanization, spaces and infrastructure here in WA, again, echoing a large part of this report. I'll carry on plugging it uh, self, uh, uh, selfishly. Uh, and then on um, the 11th of May, we'll actually be launching the report itself in an in-person event here at the University of Western Australia at 5.30 at the club. So please look, look out for that. The link uh, and information is on our website. And then finally, uh, on the 25th of May, uh, we'll have a post-federal election event entitled Dissecting Australian Life After the Election. Uh, be interesting to see what we get up to then. We've picked a sort of fairly high profile panel who are used to pol political commentary as well as a bit of uh, being practitioners in the world of politics. And that'll be at the State Theatre downtown in Perth on the 25th of May in the early evening. So look out for those, look at our website, register for those in-person and, and virtual events coming up in the future. Um, it's been a real pleasure to have uh, this conversation. I hope um, our audience have got something out of it. Uh, Omar, have a good evening yourself. Everyone, uh, thank you very much for your time this evening. Look forward to getting your feedback uh, and um, good evening. Thanks, Simon. You're welcome. <laughs>